What's going on guys? Super Tuesday, what, what? Welcome, Bone Timer Eye Studios. Super excited to have you guys in the house. Uh, we've officially been on another journey to nursery country and uh, we found this. What'd you find? Oh man. <laughs> It looks so much smaller standing in front of larger trees, but now that it's here, we're like, boy, good choice, Ryan. No, actually, uh, really, really excited about this because the big, impressive Cryptomeria is outstanding. Uh, welcome to all our Tier 1 members. Super stoked to have you guys here. Tier 2, got some new deliciousness in the uh, archive. You guys now officially have a filtration system for Tier 2 and Tier 3 members. For all our innovators, welcome. Um, filtration system for all archive videos. Now what this means is you guys can filter stream to stream by season, species, and scope of work. Um, and we also have a filter for Q&As and a filter for tertiary content. So all of the tertiary content for you tier three members is now tagged and categorized by the scope of work, the season, or the species so that you don't have to search out that tertiary content any longer. It has been a long time in the coming. It's been a, a big chunk of work and we're super stoked uh, to be bringing this live to you guys tonight. And I uh, hope you guys, I hope it enhances uh, your experience working with um, the archives and, and funneling through all the information we've been putting out there because there is a lot. Um, Kendall, do we have anything? Um, live Q&A on Thursday? Live Q&A Thursday. morning. Yeah, morning time. We'll do 10 the 10 a.m. live Q&A for you guys. All right, um, and what else were we, what else were we pondering on today? Lots. Lots, but lots. Today can... was a big day. It's been a big week, just in terms of uh, Bone Time Marai, getting back to our roots a little bit. Um, anything about the chat? Um, sure. Yeah, I'll just remind everybody to keep it uh, on topic. Obviously, nursery stock is a pretty wide berth but um yeah i'll do my best to incorporate questions as they come up and then if there's really um important questions that we don't get to we'll try to bring those to the live q a cool cool yeah. so live q a thursday 10 o'clock all right um so we had a we have a cryptomeria here today and it's the interesting thing about this and there's a, a really wonderful we are showing the tertiary clip, yeah? A really wonderful tertiary clip that's gonna kind of outline all of this and the, the ironic nature of having selected this tree because we were focusing on trunk line, uh, and you guys will see that. But Cryptomeria has long been this kind of mystery species for a lot of us, and you know, we talked about um, the, we talked about the creation uh, of the clump style juniper with the blue rug for the nursery stock series one. Then we went through traditional design with the Scots pine. We went through traditional deciduous design with the Stewardia. And now we're back to this um, ramrod straight cryptomeria and the, and the design of a formal upright bone size. Very, very uh, exciting for us. But um, I feel like this species is very, very uh, misunderstood and underutilized as a bone size specimen, and it's widely available to you guys out there um, across the country, across the world. Cryptomeria is a tree that's made it into the landscapes everywhere. So I'm pretty pumped to show you guys uh, what we can do with this tonight to play around with this. And I also am going to lean on you guys for a lot of design support to make some decisions about how we maximize the quality of this material. One of the things you know about Mariah Live that's beautiful is we get to we get to work with you guys in the studio, and um, and I'm I'm pretty excited to hear your thoughts about how we handle this treat. Before we dive into it, I've got a lot of cleaning to do so that you guys can give me your feedback on how we want to handle this piece of material. I just want to uh, kind of insert you guys into the process of material selection from another resource that we have in the Pacific Northwest and walk you guys through some of the decisions, not only in terms of trees that we ended up seeing a lot of potential in, but also the trees that maybe had some potential and we chose to walk by them and our reasons why. So check out this tertiary clip. We'll keep cleaning. We'll catch you guys on the other side and uh, we'll step into the world of design for an upright cryptomeria when we see you guys. Nursery stock series part two, American pickers of bonsai from the depths and bowels of Tsugawa's nursery today. I, I come up to Sagawa's at least two or three times a year because they have this wonderful overstock yard that's usually filled with bent, broken, contorted trees that are have been put out to pasture and are waiting to become dog food. And uh, I've found some real gems in this 
little backyard that they have. Plus, it's an incredible operation. They have beautiful, really beautiful uh, landscape material. So I like to look at that and dream about, you know, further expanding Bone Time Rise landscape while finding Bone Time material. It's uh, it's a double whammy, definitely a twofer. So we'll see what we can find today. The focus today on the material selection is line. Uh, I really want to see if we can find something super spectacular from a trunk perspective. I feel like uh, the, the piece of material that we picked up with the juniper was really about base and really kind of reconceptualizing where the base of that tree was and how we maximize that base via air layering with the blue rug. Today I'm hoping to find line. Now, line is a cagey one, right? We could, we could talk about line in terms of movement. Uh, good movement, dramatic movement, subtle movement, soft movement, how that movement dictates the design, but we could also talk about line in terms of its perfection, its straightness. And one of the things that Sugawa's is really well known for is their cryptomeria, that they grow themselves in an off-site location and, and there is the potential to find a ramrod straight cryptomeria that would be absolutely outstanding as a bonsai subject. So. We'll see where we get. We'll go through the same process of material selection because it guides everything that I do when I select a piece of material, find that base line and any features that give that tree anything special or the potential to be unique. Um, I also have my eyes wide open for some deciduous stock. So uh, fingers crossed that we land on something spectacular for the stream. Sugawa's always has something. But look at this, look at this little lot over here of just oh. abused, poor, unfortunate, souls these are the tortured souls that we look for i see cryptomeria they look rather large and in charge God, good big cryptomeria would be badass though wouldn't it cool we have arrived arrived oh <laughs> look at this look at that boom done done dunsies when you talk about ancient, right, you get these random occurrences that are completely outside of the symmetry of a young tree, like this overly large, grotesque branch at the top of a tree where it shouldn't be, but it happened because of something that is unexplainable to us long ago before we ever existed. And this tree with this wonderful, wonderful buttressing base, and then this kick-ass branch all the way up here at the top and albeit not vigorous appears to still have life moving through it we're gonna have to nurse it a little bit but to have this be almost like another tree maybe we kill off the eight off oh, done done sold I'm in that is gonna be a sweet cryptomeria so first things first, when, we're, when we see material that's valuable as a formal upright, we're looking for a trunk line that has no movement, right? And that which is like so contrary to what we typically tend to see. It's very, very unusual for people to find value in a piece of material that is ramrod straight, but that's exactly what makes a beautiful formal upright tree. The redwoods, cryptomeria, hinoki, um, doug fir, spruce of, of several species, naturally form that that ramrod straight trunk and so you know here when i when i first see this i notice that we've got this motionless trunk that alone is a feature for a formal upright tree that's really really hard to find you wouldn't believe how difficult so if you look at this one you notice that you've got this very straight trunk and then it veers right at that upper apical portion that automatically sets this piece of material aside as maybe not as good of an option for a cryptomeria now there may be a location here where we could see that straightness and have this forward lean and be able to deal with it. This piece has this interesting branch and feature as well as this wonderful line, a little bit of an imperfection at the base that we can fix, a wonderful tree for us to be selecting and utilizing, particularly when we talk about looking for and focusing on line and movement today, to find the most perfectly straight line as a focus of movement is awesome because again, what are you looking for with that movement becomes the question, not just a generally accepted concept that we need a ton of movement to have a valuable tree. Okay, number two, as far as cryptomeria is concerned, what was I gonna say? Oh, cryptomeria is a, is a 
lower elevation, almost ocean, close to the ocean, coastal variety of tree, much like the redwood in North America. And so as opposed to the branches growing down, if you look just inside of this structure, you'll notice that all of the branches are growing up. Okay, and we ha we've had streams here in recent uh, weeks where we've been talking about the nature of that origin of the structure impacting the environment. If it's up, we tend to be temperate and coastal. If it's down, we tend to be alpine and impacted by snow. So it's very fitting that the structural components of this are, are upwards. We can utilize that in the design to really reflect cryptomeria as it naturally occurs. Maybe not as it's been formed by the, the model that has created the tradition, uh, traditional form of cryptomeria, but a more natural reflection of cryptomeria. I really like this piece of material. Serendipity. So that's interesting. Last, last time at Means, we said we were looking for blue rugs. What did we find a blue rug? Here we said we're looking for an interesting line, which a perfect line, right? Uh, we find this ramrod straight cryptomeria with this interesting character feature at the upper portion of the tree that's gonna absolutely make this a cryptomeria like nobody's ever seen. There you go. Maybe we got more. I mean, this is a beautiful weeping hemlock. Look at how elegant and soft that movement is. And you've got a really good base on it. Now this is clearly a graft. You can see the graft line here, but the graft line is actually fairly well disguised and hidden. And what they've done is they've grafted a weeping specialty cultivar onto uh, probably a standard hemlock. Uh, I'm assuming Tsuga diversifolia probably. Canadian hemlock, which is interesting, but to create this big long literati out of this would be absolutely stunning with that really soft movement. This is a really strong piece of material. You have a good base, you've got soft lines, you've got branching everywhere, you've got the length to really elongate that design and create this very feminine tree. This also might be one that we take home. This, this, is, this is a legitimate piece of material. So this is a mountain hemlock right here. And I would say that that has like kind of an interesting characteristic, but now height-wise we're starting to get, it's, it's kind of long and elegant like that weeping hemlock is, except for now we're starting to get into a height that it's almost like maybe better a garden tree than, than a bonsai. I don't know, you know, this is a, that's, a, that's kind of that, I would say, subjective. Although we have a little bit of movement, we don't have a lot. We don't have something that adds the kind of quality that would make this piece of material really something we would jump after. We can see the potential in it. We can see opportunity. We can see the design. It doesn't have that thing that makes it very special. This, this piece of material for me looks like one of those compulsive nursery buys when you get the momentum of like, oh, this tree could be amazing and this tree could be amazing. And then you see this and you're like, I'll take this too, right? But this is where we need to be discerning and say, okay, we do have an okay base. We do have kind of soft movement and this literati feel to the material. So it's fairly large. We could have a larger bone side, but this would be a tree that no matter what you did design-wise, it would always lack that quality that makes it something special. And we, would, we should steer away from this. Cool. Sugawas didn't disappoint. Nah. I mean, fairly standard. Something could be done with it. It doesn't offer that, doesn't offer that punch power. I, I, I do like the small, I do like the small needles of these spruce, as well as when I look here, notice the pr prevalence of all those back buds. That means you could keep this super uh, tight and compact. And this is uh, Picea orientalis, oriental spruce. Never worked with it before. I don't know anything about it. Oof. Here we go. Take a look at that. Ah, so now this is again, when we talk about good movement, we've got several changes in direction. We've got a very, fairly long straight section here. It's always possible to add more movement to an area like that, but the thing that we've got to be aware of here is that this whirl right here has grown and created a significant amount of inverse swelling compared to the piece below it. 
I immediately would steer away from this and just say, listen, there's not enough merit here to justify utilizing this piece of material with that abrupt of an inverse swelling that at that location on the trunk. And we would lose the better portion of the base if we wanted to try and do something about that. So this is something we should steer away from. Suga Curly. And then Weeping Hemlock, that's, that is funky. Five feet tall and eight to 10 feet wide. So, you know, a lot of times we come to a nursery and, and, and we fixate on these tiny dwarf miniatures as potential material. And I, I definitely don't want to dissuade you guys from finding valuable inventory like this. But again, I want to go back to the fact that you are dealing with a piece of material that genetically has a mutation and has a growth habit that is different than a lot of the growth habits that we're trying to utilize and achieve in bonsai. And because it's small and it's dwarf, we say, oh my gosh, that'd be amazing. As you kind of mature in bonsai, you realize that it's actually potentially an impediment depending on what you want to do with it. Now there's opportunity inside of this to use this as a small, maybe a cascading hemlock or something like that. Could be very beautiful, but just be aware and don't be drunk with that small compactness because it can be an impediment to good bonsai creation as much as a feature or a potential asset to that. <laughs> Holy smokes. So this is like, I'm probably not gonna be taking this home today, but if we're just talking about the exercise of finding line, as I walk up on this material, I automatically notice, boom, boom, boom. Look at that, look at that trunk line. Boom, boom, and then this is the apex. And to cut this off here and to have this nice, compact, stout, super strong trunk, immediate, immediate standout in terms of potential. Now this, I'm guessing because of the abnormal number of branches coming from that one location, if we look at the rest of the trunk, we'll recognize that there's a pretty significant inverse taper there. If there weren't though, I would say this would be a highly valuable piece of deciduous stock from nursery source. And it would all hinge on pulling back that burlap, uncovering that base and seeing if you have a flare or if you have a, a propensity towards a piece of inverse taper. But just in terms of identifying line, what you guys are seeing there is a beautiful, beautiful line if you select the branches accordingly and are able to reduce the size of the canopy. This, this could be an extremely valuable nursery stock. This is a Tilia cordata. This is a little leaf linden. A wonderful variety for bonsai. Absolutely exceptional European variety of tree. We may spend a little time looking at the Tilia today. This is a super valuable piece of material. I mean, it, it, it already has like a natural tree shape. They take to, Tilia takes to reduction of big branches very well. It has really pronounced, uh, if you can come in here, you see these ridges on these shoulders right here, these rings and these divides. You could cut above this and it wouldn't die back beyond that, which gives Tilia the ability on a large tree like this to be reduced significantly. This is really, really impressive. Uh, but it also is a, a tree and you can see right here, here you have a dead stub and you can see where the bark is kind of flaking off there because it's been compartmentalized right on that shoulder. This is exactly what we're talking about in that pruning process. This won't die back beyond this, we'll maintain life here. So when we have these big trees and we're gonna be reducing them, if they've got these indicators that they're capable of being heavily pruned, we know we can get a much uh, smaller tree out of these without risking dieback and heavy, heavy portions of shari on the trunk. That too contributes to our consideration in the purchase of material. And we're always looking for more, I think, deciduous stock. I said I was, I said I might be hunting for deciduous, right? Sheesh. That's four pieces of material that we've found. This is horrible. I'm not trying to expand the number of trees we have to water and take care of, but that's kind of what's happening today. I'm just buying the Cryptomeria today because I've got to, got to justify to myself all three of the little lindens. I'm struggling with that justification right now. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah.
Yeah. Will do. Thank you for your help. Yes. Very much My appreciate pleasure. it. Have, yeah, a have a great day. Great day. Thank Thanks. You so much. Bam! Mine! All right. So, uh, clearly, I fell in love instantaneously with this guy or girl, depending on how you choose to look at it. Um, yeah, sometimes you see that thing, and we talked about this in Nursery Stock Series 1. Sometimes you see that thing that has that really defining characteristic. And for me, with this piece of material in the Cryptomeria, this big branch that comes up here has clearly, there's actually cut marks in it where it was like, ah, oh, we don't want you. Uh, you know what, we'll leave you. I'm gonna tear you off. Ah, uh, you're still existing. It carries a lot of the scars of the growth of this piece of material. But one of the other things that was really uh, interesting to me, and Ricardo, if you can, if you can uh, show everybody the base here. Okay, this base, has a tremendous buttress and flare to it. And I've just pulled back some of the burlap here and you guys can actually see really clearly some of these surface roots that flare right there. And that's a really important aspect, right? We always, even though the focus of this was line, showing this buttress and having that base that kind of catalyzes the design as the point of origin where it grips the ground is a really important thing for us. Now, as we rotate, we continue to see that flare basically 360 degrees. It's occurring from this, this uh, trunk, which is really abnormal. Now, we do have this little dip right here. We do have this kind of slight in inset here, which means anywhere where we see that inverse taper is probably off of the board. Now, being off the board, and I'm going to rotate this back towards the front of the tree so that you can see it. There's two things about this. So we've got this inverse taper squeezing in here, but then we've got this big, thick branch protruding out in, in a two-dimensional two fashion if we did consider this to be the front. So we would never want that big feature to be functioning in a two-dimensional plane with the rest of the trunk. I already had erased this portion as a potential front based on the position of that feature branch in that two-dimensional plane from the very beginning, let alone considering this kind of smaller portion here in that inverse taper. So as you guys were watching that clip, I've been kind of thinking about potential fronts, and I'm just going to kind of rotate this for you guys uh, several times so that you can have a really good look at the tree in a 360 degree view. And I want you guys to kind of give me some ideas based on the presence or the location of this big thick branch. Oh, it's off to the right, it's to the right rear, it's to the right front, it's to the left rear, it's to the left front. Where we would want that in, in relationship to the rest of the features and characteristics that this trunk is giving us to give us the cleanest, most straight, formal upright line because we talk about movement as multiple changes in direction. Tonight, talking about the value of formal upright movement is to speak of the value of a lack of change in direction. And I think that's a really fun play to kind of draw out our and, and recalibrate our conscious thought about uh, movement as it pertains to bonsai. So I'm just going to rotate here. I have my ideas formed. If you guys have anything to add, tell Kendall on the chat where you're thinking the best front for this tree will be. We can change the angle to do any kind of compensation that we need to. But let's see where we as a cumulative group tend to see the front being. So will you grab me that four gauge and some chalk? Okay, cool. So I think it goes without saying, too, when you guys start looking at a species like Cryptomeria or Hinoki or Redwood or any of those, and we get this formal upright style that is an inherent growth, thank you, sir, that is an inherent growth characteristic, one of the most interesting things in my mind that you guys can utilize to give that uh, material value is this concept of short long. And if you guys look at traditionally styled Cryptomeria in the Japanese Kokufu books, you'll, 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 first of all, you'll have a hard time finding many, right? But what you'll notice is there are these shorter branches on the bottom and these longer branches up in the midsection of the tree. And then they get shorter again towards the top. And that's a really interesting aspect of cryptomeria, very uh, descriptive aspect of these formal upright styles that have a forest floor, that have a lot of shading going on. So to see 
as I'm rotating here, these really small, nice little tufts down low, and then these bigger, longer pieces up high, that actually is very representative and reflective of the species. So Kendall, if, if anybody's throwing out ideas. Yes. What do you got? Um, Eric says uh, pointing, the, that big branch pointing to the right. Okay. Um, pointing to our right. Okay. Um, and then Chris says the left front seems good. But um, Eric likes it here, somewhere there, right? And Chris likes it where? To the left front. To the left front. All right, so let's come back here. Bishop also is thinking left front. Left front. That's interesting. So is Graham. Yeah, yeah that's very interesting. So uh, as far as Eric, as far as your feedback is concerned, my initial thought was this branch pointing to the right. So let me come back to where we're at here. Right? This gives you a really beautiful straight trunk. Now we've got some inverse taper, so we can kind of flirt that towards the front. You can pick up on this buttress, it starts to eliminate this neck down, right? And we get this super ramrod straight line, okay? But if we, all of a sudden, we kind of continue rotating, and we come to this point here, we also get that same straightness that you actually had over here, but we get a little bit of a better flare, and we have a little bit of a better branch positioning. So this kind of really solid, straight, uh, proud line coming up from the base. Nice little tiny branch there. Um, and it's leaning away from us a little bit. Ricardo, I don't know if you can zoom out and kind of show this backward tilt. Let me know if you can. We good? Okay, and then I'm going to fix that. I want to change that. This is one of the areas that I feel like we could work on. Yep. Can I get that at least up? Yeah, something like that. Let me see what we got here. Oof. And it looks like I need it to rotate a little bit there. What'd that do? Small adjustments, wow. Okay, wow. I think I gotta go, I think I have to go somewhere right in here. I think this is where we need to be, guys. I definitely, definitely love the line from the other side. I think we have a solid base without the risk of that inverse taper becoming too prominent in the design. We get that branch just slightly forward so we don't have two dimensions here. We slightly forward with this big feature. We got this nice little branch towards the front. We've got these little tufts that are like, oh, we're here too, right? And then all of these other pieces, we can start to kind of form and create a structure around so that we, we, we can build. Now, here's the next question for you guys. Would this tree with this kind of damage and torture to that piece, would this have a fully living apex all the way to the top or not? That is a big question, right? And my initial thought and concept was that we gin the top, but it feels kind of counterproductive to have a gin gin as a design concept. And there's something interesting about this sort of canopy being very, very long and tall. But I'm curious what you guys think. Um, so give me your feedback on that. I'm gonna start reducing some of these lower branches and you guys can let me know. And Kendall, if anybody has any questions, fire away. Sure. I'm just gonna shorten some of these branches down below here. This looks like cool, thank you. This is an interesting one, huh? Gives us a lot of length over there. This one feels kind of important. There. Boom. Or we could do away with that. And then lean on this, let's do that. Let's show that junction. So we'll come down here. Don't necessarily need that length, or do we? Do we want that length? Let's give ourselves the opportunity to have some fun with that length. What do they say about the apex? I think we're still uh, waiting on the lag, time lag. Time um, lag? Someone commented it looks like a cactus. Dude, it does look <laughs> like a cactus, right? the Saguaro feel. Yeah. My, I have a question. Where Maybe you already answered this, but where does cryptomeria naturally Yeah, cryptomeria grow? is a species that grows on the island of Japan. And it might grow in other parts of Asia, but I don't... I think so. I think cryptomeria is a Japanese species of tree um, that grows in a lower elevation, as we said on the on the um, 
live stream while we were searching through the nursery, right? And, and Cryptomeria is really a lower elevation, almost coastal, kind of like the redwoods, very straight grained, extremely rot resistant variety of tree. So they used it a lot in traditional Japanese construction, as well as in the construction of boats and other maritime vessels. So it's, it's really closely tied to a lot, of the, um, a lot of the original temples for the Shinto, as well as the Buddhist temples and whatnot. It's, it's an extremely uh, important species of tree for the culture of Japan. And one of the, one of the most striking places that I've ever been is uh, Nikko, which is on the Utsunomiya line. It's at the end of the Utsunomiya line. You go past Mr. Kimura's place from Tokyo, another hour and a half. And uh, Ieyasu Tokugawa, one of the original um, Tokugawa shoguns of Japan, had his summer meditation spot in Nikko. And this is actually just past Kanuma, where all of the uh, Kanuma soil and the Satsuki azaleas are field grown for bonsai. But um, Ieyasu Tokugawa would go there and he would meditate in the summer because it was hot, uh, a little bit up off of the beaten path, very, very quiet, and it's absolutely, it's a World Heritage Site. It's probably the best. People talk about Kyoto and Nara and stuff in Japan. I would send people to Nikko in a heartbeat. To, and uh, one of the striking things about Nikko are the domesticated cryptomeria that are manicured around um, Ieyasu Tokugawa's meditation site. Okay, got some comments. We um, got so people are still talking about where they think that big branch would be best. Uh -huh. um, Paul says, I think the big branch would be better a quarter turn to the back. Quarter turn um, to the but back. But then people are discussing the inverse taper. Uh -huh. And then Bishop's wondering if there's any good branches coming off, to, um, off the side of, the big, of that branch. Oh, so yeah, good question. So let me just pull this aside here. And I got to be really careful with cryptomeria because it's very, very brittle. So this is the growth that's coming off of it. It's got to be nurtured, right? And we would want to carry that growth a little bit here or a little bit up. And so when we start to look at this, we've got to be thinking about that pretty consistently in the design of where that's going to be going, creating structure around it. Now, if I'm just kind of giving you guys my um, crash course in front selection, we've got the buttress of the trunk here. We've got the straightest line. This is actually the straightest line on the tree from right here, this front. Now there is a slight, slight inverse taper. We actually have a little bit more of a narrow base down here than we do right below this or right between this branch. There's a little bit of a thickening here before this next down. And I can take this off at the trunk and kind of clean up that thickness. But this branch is perfectly placed to hide that little bit of thickness. And it's a beautiful branch along with this one right here. Right in that small portion where we've got all of this negative space, I would never want to eliminate this. This is a super important piece of growth, okay? Now, the way that we execute a formal upright design, and this is very contrary to the way that you see it executed in traditional design where we have this triangular shape. When we're executing formal upright design, this play of short, long, short, long is how you move people's eyes through the silhouette. And putting a lot of value into these shorter pieces cultivating those, having some length here, moving back into the short and back out to the long. Throughout the elevation of this tree is what's going to make it feel natural. Now, if we want this to be a skyscraper of a tree, we're going to narrow this silhouette significantly. We've got a proportion, though, that we've got to maintain here so that it's actually believable. And that's what we've got to really protect in the creation of this design. So when I look at this, I see this small piece here. I see this piece as kind of this next long piece that comes out from the side here kind of up and forms our first real long prominent branch. If we're going to use this, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get rid of that piece right there so that we have that clear delineation, okay? Now notice in the design process, we've got boom, boom, boom. We've got three branches right here and this one here for depth. Now the one for depth, we're going to carry that off to the back and decrease its length in terms of this design, okay? But what do we do with these guys here becomes the next question because this is a very long, prominent branch right here. One of these probably needs to come slightly to the front if this is gonna stay here, or this needs to come, yep, still okay, come slightly to the front, and one of these can go more towards the back. Now my feeling is we can, because we've got this piece right here coming out of this section, right? That actually creates a fourth line, one, two, three, four. Four lines in that section of design. How do we want to use that? Do we eliminate this? Now does this space and this space become equal? Do we, do we, if, if we move that and we take this out, 
Do we get that? If we take this out, or if we take this out, do we have long short? This becomes the question of a formal upright design. We got some feedback about the gin and apex. What do you got the gin? What do you, what do you have for that? Um, so Alex says, bring some of those branches uh, on the left down and out behind the deadwood. No okay. gin. Okay. Uh, keep the apex or shorten it below the tip of the deadwood. Okay. And then Jason says, no gin on the apex. Bring the branches back around behind the big gin to keep it from looking like a cactus. Over here. <laughs> to avoid the swar then, swaro style. Yeah. John <laughs> says... Gin at the top of the center trunk, uh -huh. but keep a little foliage above the junction with the left trunk, uh -huh. and keep the left trunk alive and taller than the center trunk. Ah. Okay. Oh, geez. Got a huge hornet's nest in here. No way. Yeah. Is it alive? Yeah, yeah, active? there's a bunch of them. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> huh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm really not kidding. I'll rotate this over towards Ricardo. You can see this. I'm surprised they haven't come out. You see that? Those guys are, those guys are getting ready to rage. Oh, now they've all stopped moving. Do you see that? What do I do? Shit. They're all literally looking at me like, yeah, try it. <laughs> well, this is a first. Well, this is definitely live. Uh-huh, this is live, yeah. What do we do about that? We, yeah. <sighs> yeah, I don't think we have a choice. I think we gotta take it outside. Everyone says, get outside, get it out, <laughs> get it out, yeah. get the spray. <laughs> All right, Lime, you ready? We will be right back, guys. <laughs> oh, man. Well, there you go. <laughs> any, any stings? No stings. No, no stings. stings? No stings. That was expert. They were definitely after Lyme. <laughs> they were most upset at Lyme. <laughs> okay. All right, that was. Whoa. Dynamic. Gym. I'm just, uh, I'm surprised that we were able to load this into the truck where this thing literally got stuffed. I know, that's what people in the chat were saying. Into the chat. But that, that's always the way of it, right? The, the, they were like, the wasps were literally sitting They're there. They're like, this like, is our home. We're not going to leave. <laughs> what are you guys doing? <laughs> right, right, right. So, yeah, recreating nature. So, anyways, they screwed up the scale of the composition. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to rotate. Give me a second here. I'm going to rotate this for you guys. Take a little look at the backside of this. And more importantly, Ricardo, if you can show the crown right here, now that we're, now that we're a little bit more clear of wasps and hornets and all things kind of crazy. Notice how the, the canopy of this, the crown, actually splits off into multiple kind of regions and directions. This is really, really natural and normal for a formal upright tree, which doesn't necessarily fit this kind of idolized model that we see. But at the top of a redwood, you don't just have one leader that's forming the apex of a redwood. At the top of a cryptomeria, you don't have the same thing you have multiple apices that are creating the top of the tree. So when we're looking at this from the front, we gotta be figuring out how we reconcile that whole area of the tree. And I honestly, I'm designing in real time with you guys as we work through this because I haven't had a lot of time to see this tree without all of the mess of branches that are on it. So for me, this is a first as well. And I really don't know what to do. Kendall, what do you think? Sujata has a suggestion. What's Sujata got? Uh, Sujata says the apex could be a couple of inches higher than the gin, uh, and, and, then, and then how about a couple of short pointed gins coming out of the main trunk? Ooh, could do that. Taking inspiration from Northern India. Could do that, could do that, a little Northern India style. Do I need to scoot this back, Arthur? Yeah, a little bit. How's that? Perfect. Whew. Thanks, Slim. 
Paul's wondering if this small branch down here will cause thickening in the base. It's actually going to cause thickening at the point we want thickening most. But yeah, it definitely will, Paul, if I let it run. Come back here. Still trying to recover from the trauma of what just happened. They're going to be waiting outside for us. Yeah, really. no, they're definitely waiting. <laughs> they're definitely strategizing like, hey, hey, when they come out, let's jack those guys. Okay, so I'm going to say... I know that I don't want this to be super, super big and strong, right? It's already tall enough. So up towards the top here, Ricardo, if you can blast into this interior and show me this, this big kind of thick guy. I'm going to strip this of all growth, and I'm going to say we're going to go ahead and do away with this. It's going to the back of our proposed front, right? So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the growth on this, and I'm going to shorten this. Now, I don't want this apex to be super long and tall, right? I'm sure that changed a lot of stuff from the front. Okay, so I'm going to take that off. And then I've got this other big, thick piece back here. You guys, if you're in the front, you can kind of see this, right? Right here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take this off as well. I don't want this to be any bigger than what it already is. Now, I don't want to create a gin. I've got this gin right here. I either have to have the apex higher than this or lower than this, but I can't have the apex equivalent with this. This would be a what I would consider to be a pretty big design faux pas. So we're gonna steer clear of creating that same elevation. Now I've got some pieces of living tissue up in this area that I'm gonna start shortening now that we've made some decisions on ultimate length so that we do have some proportion that actually feels pretty fitting to the rest of the decisions that we've made here. All right? And then I've got a few pieces up in here I'm just kind of clearing out some stuff. Gosh, they're so brittle. So, 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 so brittle. Paul says take the high left side branch and pull it down into the long hanging branch. This for, guy? Removing all the others. This guy? Let's see what that looks like, Paul. Yeah, this I is think it's left side. His left side over his here. His left, yeah. Pull it down into here. So I like this big long piece here. This is going to sit center. This feels like this can come off right here. I want to show this line. Okay, let's make that another firm kind of established stance. I want to show this upright line. I want to show this big, long, right? Even when we see redwoods, when you talk about really tall trees, when you see kind of a formal upright in the Japanese style, it's very dense. You can't see the upper portion. Maybe you only see the first 30%. When you see a truly upright, tall, ancient tree, which this is giving us that lead into that ancient form, that abnormal branch, all of a sudden we're able to see so much more of that tree. And just getting up in here and having a little space to see all of this, man, it's changing everything about the way that I think about this. Now, I'm gonna rotate this for you guys again because I see an opportunity. So we've got deadwood on this major structural piece here. We've got deadwood back here. We've got this piece and we've got this piece. Those are both giving us super gems, right? But then we've got all of this stuff all of this stuff over here that I feel like, ooh, do we take those off? Do we just gin that whole piece? So Ricardo, if we're where you're at, what I'm talking about is saying we can use this big piece right here, okay? In the background, there's a piece back here, but do we gin this entire section here, all of this section so that we've got this big dead section here, we've got these two smaller pieces kind of sprouting up, that plays well with this idea of this having experienced something. And we can actually shorten this gin if we need to as well. All right, I'm gonna do it. I'm going for it. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, Graham says the gin is, should be the main feature and should be dominant with a complementing apex around it. Ooh, okay. I, and, like the, I like the idea of the apex interacting with the gin, right? And then the, Jason says, the apex should be higher than the big gin, the top of the gin at the edge of your silhouette. Okay, all right. I like that idea too. Feel like, I feel like we might either shorten this or we need to shorten everything else, but we're getting there. This creates an interesting little section of tortured trunk there. What do you think? What do you think, Kendall? This branch is now all the more prominent, right? Yeah, it definitely is. I think it's cool to make it a prominent. You can't help but look at it. I, I mean, do too. I think, I think it's amazing. This is amazing. And we're still down here with what the heck do we do with all of that stuff, right? This is, this is really bothersome, isn't it? These three. 
all being on the same. Yeah. What do we do right here? Hmm. So we got this thing, this big massive Titan. I think we can safely assume we're not gonna need all that much. Okay, cryptomeria will back bud, I mean profusely, and I do mean profusely. So I feel like we can very freely, and I feel like this slender guy here, let's take that off. Okay, so now that's there. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give myself a little, a little shortness here, and I'm gonna leave this length right in here. I feel like that's gonna be important. Now, be aware of this idea right here. Ricardo, go ahead and come in tight here. So when we're bending cryptomeria, they tear, but they break extremely easy. And if we pull at the wrong angle, they just, they just flip right off, right? So cryptomeria is extremely difficult. Whenever you have the establishment of an acute angle here, that acute angle is extremely fragile, particularly on the bigger branches. These are so obviously super gummy, okay? That angle is very, 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 very delicate. So we've got to be careful when we start to move these upper pieces around. I like what we've got going here. This is good. Good. I'm going to take off a few of these spindly guys as well. Kind of think about how long we want some of these pieces to be over in this section. I'm going to shorten this guy here. It's really interesting to start to create story around the tree that we're actually building together, right? Because then we get to kind of dialogue about how this thing comes to fruition. That is starting to take on such a more prominent role. Notice how the design is changing as we're pulling in from the sides. Now, all of this centers around the establishment of that single, really, really beautiful line, right? That, that started the entire story. That started the environmental discussion, started the species discussion, started the idea of this short, long, how we start to maximize all of the pieces of this. This gives us the idea of age. It gives us the idea of asymmetry. Now we've got these long, we've got short, we've got long again. Let's start to set some structure from the bottom moving up. We'll prune these branches and get these ready for wire. And as we set structure moving up towards the top, I think we're gonna come to a very clear idea of what this tree needs to look like. Kind of build this together. And if you guys have questions as I'm doing this, feel free to let it rip. There's definitely some design comments. Coming. Design comments. Um, yeah, agreeing with you to take those bottom branches on the right off and then... These guys or this one? The ones that you took off. Okay, cool, cool. And then uh, Rennie says, I think the tree needs to tell a story that the gin was a, the leader for a long time. Ooh. But then a shoot from the main trunk took over and, when, and then the competing leader died. Um, well, and th but think about this. Think about this in terms of that story. Why would this be the leader that then this took over. This was the leader that then this took over, but failed, right? And you'll see this in the Redwoods. Either this was being shaded, it was slightly weaker. Something happened that created that dialogue for sure. And then Eric says, make it look like the big old spruce and fir trees in the Olympic National Forest. You know this, Eric. <laughs> Speaking my language now. Talking, talking dirty to us. <laughs> All right, let's do a little bit of this structural work here. My favorite, my favorite work of all. So I'm gonna be rotating for you guys so that you can kind of follow along. Now I want to avoid as much as I can the, the, the presence of a lot of thick wire on the front of the tree, but that does not overwhelm the necessity for structural integrity and function in my wire. So as I'm applying this now, I'm actually entering the bottom side of both of these shoulders, and there's a reason why, okay? When we talk about structural wire, if we want to raise a branch, we wanna raise a branch to show environment, right? We need to have that wire on the bottom of that initiation of the shoulder from the trunk. Because as we raise, that branch naturally wants to come back down, and that wire being right against that trunk at that point where that movement's being made, that's what gives our wire function and uh, sol solidarity, okay? So last time, or excuse me, two times ago when we did the Scots Pine and we brought every single branch down, all of those wires approach the shoulder from the top, OK? 
okay? Where that branch originated from the trunk, we entered the top side. These, all of these branches are gonna be going up, not because it's a deciduous tree, but because this is more of a coastal reference to the species. Coastal meaning we don't have snow, bringing all of those branches down. And if you see how brittle cryptomeria is, you understand that snow and cryptomeria, they wouldn't work well together. Adrian mentioned that you're just pretending like the hornets never happened. I did. I am. <laughs> just got to move, move, move forward into the I, future. I, I, I am. <laughs> if I have to be... So uh, I get stung by hornets at least two times a year. For Since I was in college, I, I landscaped my college roommate's father's home once uh, one summer break, and I got caught underneath a rhododendron pruning, and there was an in-ground hornet's nest, and I was, I, was, I was crawling in to prune some lower branches. I started getting stung, and I couldn't get out of the rhododendron, and I got stung like 46 times. And, and ended up passing out inside of his house with ice on, and his mom came home and found me, and it was, like this, it was like this big deal, right? And ever since then, every year I get stung twice, at least twice. And this year I have not been stung once, okay? So those, those tonight I was like, of course I'm going to run into a hornet's nest during the live stream in a year where I'm due up for my hornet's experience. There they are. So I'm just going to move right past it. We're not going to speak about it again as a community. <laughs> and I go ahead and acknowledge that we dodged a bullet. Looking towards the future. Yeah, move towards the future. Pierre says, Pierre still thinks the gin branch should be shortened. I think it could be shortened too. Let's see what happens. So knowing that these branches can tear right off, I want to get a few of these branches positioned. And then we can see where we're going. Now I want, I want to point out to you guys the, the wire cutters that I'm using. You know, we don't talk a lot about the equipment um, that we work with at Mirai, and I think we're gonna start talking about it a lot more because you guys have, have asked a lot about the equipment. These are Nipex pliers. They're on our web store, and actually, if you look below the, the live stream, we've started carrying these. They're a German-made product. Um, I'm half German, so that's awesome. Um, those Germans, you know, quite the engineers. And uh, the thing that makes these valuable, one, they've got the padding, which you guys can get on other tools. Uh, ergonomically shaped so that it distributes the pressure point when you cut wire. But the biggie is right here where you see these du this double rivet head. And when I open this up, in between the cutting jaws, there's this little dowel right there. It's a little perfectly placed metal dowel that's a leverage point for these two hinges to distribute the force. Now these two hinges increase your mechanical advantage and along with the, the shape and the distribution of the pressure points, a lot easier on your hands. I'm cutting four gauge, and I'm cutting four gauge without a lot of effort. Um, I started having significant hand problems, mainly based on cutting wire with traditional bonsai wire cutters. And ever since I've moved to Nipex, those problems have gone away. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're below. If you guys want to buy a pair from us, that, that's great. We carry them because we believe in the product. Anyways, there you have it, four gauge wire cutters that make your life a lot easier. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try to, again, keep as little wire on the, on the front or hide my wire as much as possible, but also maintain to the best of my ability the, the function of the wire. And I want to maintain a very beautiful angle as I come across the front of this trunk because you guys are going to see this structural wire. It's going to be very apparent on a tree that you see so much of the trunk with. And this is where, you know, we definitely, definitely try to avoid in uh, literati trees and whatnot, putting wire on the trunk. Unless you're styling the trunk for the first time and then you make all those turns look super beautiful. Um, but this is a really important technique and a really important part of bone. So I'll turn this towards the front so you guys can kind of see my structural work, right? So again, this hand, as I'm working here, the most important point is where this contacts the shoulder here. So I'm gonna have my thumb, and, and notice I've got a white knuckle grip. I'm really digging that structural wire into the base of that, okay? Once I've got that set, I always want to have contact with at least two turns back here, trying to, to skip all of those fine buds that are going to create my eventual branch structure on this. Obviously, this has all been shaded out over the course of time because this was going to be a big tree. Okay, so I'm maintaining a good hold, and then I've got this out here at the tip. I'm using that mechanical advantage 
so that I'm able to get as clean of an application, work hard in the wire as little as possible. And then if I get a gap or I have a low amount of contact, I can always loosen and watch. I'm gonna squeeze this wire. I'm gonna hold here with my index, squeeze this wire into the branch and that basically presses that in there right as I'm tightening it, gets that nice firm contact, okay? So again here, I've set this here just to kind of be able to wire this proficiently. I come back, I dig that into the shoulder. Now I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna be working two, two bends back always, okay? Using that mechanical advantage of the tip. And one of the things that I always teach my students at Mirai and that I want you guys to really focus on with your big thick wire moving forward. When we wire with finer wire, we typically tend to loop the wire, right? We put a loop in it, we put a loop in it. You shouldn't do that with copper wire, but you shouldn't do that with wire in general. So when we're dealing with big thick wire, we function in lines, right? The way that you move your wire is in lines. So you don't see me moving my arms like this as I'm applying wire, right? I'm moving my arms here, 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 here. And every time that I'm doing that, this hand that's supporting, if I'm moving this wire here, I'm pulling here to zero out the force on that branch. So boom, 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 right? So that straight line as opposed to that loop is what prevents me from work hardening this copper wire, particularly on the biggest gauges. And I made the, um, I made the uh, point last week or the week prior that I had a 70 year old female student who said, oh, I can't use eight gauge. Now she's using six gauge and has attempted four gauge with a really good proficient result just based on the understanding of how to use this supporting hand, using your mechanical advantage, and functioning in straight lines as opposed to work hardening that wire before you ever apply it. These are big, big techniques to be able to help you guys take a piece of material like this, put proficient structural wire on it. Whoop. We didn't need that anyways. Put professional, <laughs> proficient structural wire on it and get the kind of moves that you need to set that structure. Paul's uh, wondering if you worry about the fragility of joint when wire. When wire. You have to. You have to, which is what this hand is for. Always supporting, always taking the pressure off of the branch. Okay? All right. Okay, so now, in terms of setting structure on this tree, really big point here that I want you guys to key into. The point of origin of this shoulder right here. Let me come around to the other side. Actually, I'm going to rotate this towards Ricardo so you guys can see this. We'll zoom in to the exact front. I'll square it up to Ricardo. Okay, so when we're looking here, the point of origin of this branch and the point of origin of this branch, notice that this branch is actually behind the rotation or the curvature of the trunk and this branch is more towards the front. If that's the case, this branch has to go back. This branch has to come forward. Now that's the last thing I actually wanna do because I know that this has a strong opportunity to break. I know that this has a strong opportunity to break. But because the tree has already set that order of its structure in motion, the only thing I can do is respect that, okay? So I've, gotta, I've got to respect that position in the structure of the tree. Now this is important because these originally, when we were looking at it, lined up, and we were talking about how do we handle these lining up? Now that one goes back, now this one goes forward, and I'm kind of being a baby about this one, but let me, let me just get, let me get a little bit aggressive with it. Boom, okay. Right, now that that comes forward and that one comes back, we start to separate these planes and create a lot more rush interest in the way that the branches are laid out, okay? So having that established order, so now when we come back up to here, this one and this one are almost on the same plane. I've got this one coming forward. I'm just gonna take this one back a little bit. Just a little bit, not dramatic. Okay, maybe take it down a little bit. Put a little bit of movement into that. Okay, this feels nice. I'm not a super huge fan of this being so long, so let me get one more turn out here. Urgh. Four gauge when it's not so huh, long. 
get that guy down so that we can start to have a little bit of fun with that. Maybe we'll leave that long and this will be that first big long piece right there. That feels legitimate, that feels potentially design worthy. And I've got this piece right here. I don't know how long I want this to be, but in order to give myself the opportunity to play and really design with some freedom, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna lay, gosh, I'm gonna lay that out as well. And I like that, I like that nice kind of soft, subtle coastal incline, not straight down. You can't bring these down and out. That's not the way a cryptomeria grows. We're staying inside of those design concepts, okay? Now this one here is important because this is gonna come straight and this is gonna be the first branch that cuts our line. So let me come back to the front over here. I have several uh, interesting stories about my experiences with Cryptomeria as an apprentice. There was a uh, client who brought, he brought a, 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 like a $5 nursery stock. I, might have, I actually may have said this in the first nursery stock series. He brought a $5 piece of nursery stock into Mr. Kimura and he said, um, you know, can you, can you style this into a wonderful bonsai? And Mr. Kimura kind of, you know, pointed at me and he said, what do you think? And I said, I can't believe, you know, I kind of, kind of scoffed. And he said, what are you scoffing at? And I said, well, I can't believe somebody would bring, you know, a piece of material that looks like that to you. And he said, well, why wouldn't he? And I said, well, because your, 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 your skill set is so far above that. And he said, yeah, but who, who better than me to set the structure on a tree for, you know, the beginning of its life as a bonsai. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, well, maybe, you know, like that's weird, I thought he would agree with me. I thought, you know, for all of the times Mr. Kimura has scoffed at trees, this is definitely a lesser scoffing opportunity than some of the brilliant trees that have come into his nursery. Anyways, uh, he tagged me with the, <laughs> with the task of wiring that tree. So I wired it out, uh, totally failed miserably. He pointed out every single place that I had done less than a stellar job, adjusted it, made this amazing tree. I actually got to work on that tree every single year for the six years of my apprenticeship and watch that cryptomeria become an amazing piece of bonsai material, an absolute, ab absolutely amazing tree. Not from the perspective of winning the Kokfu, but to see this really humble piece of material just become magnificent was uh, super, super humbling. And uh, to think that, ah, okay, simple material can become incredible as a bonsai. Okay, I like this. I don't like how straight those branches are. Let's fix that a little bit. Let's come up a little bit. And then let's come down a little bit. <clears throat> Bishop has a question uh, with respect to the environment. Uh -huh. uh, Bishop's wondering, how could the tree still be so brittle on the coast since it has to deal with the high winds? <clears throat> yeah, interesting, right? And the answer to that is, I don't, I don't know. I don't know that. Um, what you do see with cryptomeria is most of the time, the older trees are very, very broken. And if you guys go online and you type in Jomon Cedar, J-O-M-O-N, Jomon Cedar, it's the oldest living cryptomeria in the world. And um, it was also in Works of Divinity, the documentary about Shinji Suzuki when he goes there and he cries in front of it. Um, super cool. But the, the, well, you'll see what an authentic cedar in an old growth form looks like. Um, it's really, really impressive. But what you'll notice is it's broken. It's extremely broken, extremely fractured tree. And that's exactly kind of the same idea that we're going for here. What you'll also notice is that it's not perfectly ramrod straight. It spiders into this upper apical um, kind of multi-faceted um, structure, just the same as redwoods on the coast of California, um, and has a real similar vibe to the redwoods. So Paul's wondering if those movements are damaging the bark in the structural wiring. <clears throat> if they were damaging the bark, we would be in trouble because cryptomeria doesn't really tolerate a loss of water transport through the tree. 
they're definitely not damaging the bark. And cryptomeria has a very thick, uh, thick solid bark and a thick phloem layer and a thick cambial layer and a, and a lot of water transport through the um, xylem. And you could actually air layer a cryptomeria anywhere. So we talked about air layering needing a branch below the point of air layering on most conifers. That doesn't apply to larch and it doesn't apply to cryptomeria. You could absolutely air layer a cryptomeria anywhere. It'll produce roots because they transport so much water. Okay. How's it looking, Kendall? Looks really good. So far, so good? Reminds me of like a high altitude tree. A high altitude tree? You're not supposed to say that. I, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Shoot. Now we're failing. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. So I think this is important, yeah? This guy here, this one doesn't feel as important and it's also working in conjunction with this. <sighs> So I actually have another, have another really funny story about cryptomeria. Cryptomeria was the very first bonsai species that I ever demonstrated on after my apprenticeship, which was interesting because I had, I had only worked on the one during the entirety of my time at Mr. Kimura's, that, that cheap $5 piece of material. And I was in Sacramento at the American Bonsai uh, Club's um, whatever, their uh, club show. And, uh, and, <laughs> and they had this big, massive field-grown cryptomeria. And they're like, here you go. You, you've worked on cryptomeria, right? And I was like, yeah, sure. I, yeah, I yeah, got it. No problem. And uh, they're like, wow, it's, you know, this, this looks like good beer. Mind you, the branches were all like this big and pointing straight up. And at the top, it went into these two opposite directions of the straightest portion of the trunk. First demonstration ever, I take a sawzall, cut a wedge out of both of those pieces, take those diagonals, sandwich them together as one singular leader, style this thing out, it's still alive. Uh, Gary and Lucy Judd in California have that tree and Bjorn has worked on it since then to refresh the design. It looks great, I can't believe. Uh, that was my first ever demonstration. Go figure. So anyways, me and Cryptomeria, we go back a long ways. Pierre's wondering if you, um, would you not consider the shape of the big branch while shaping the secondary branches? I think you have to, right? I think you absolutely have to consider the shape of, of this big massive branch. Now notice that it comes out at this angle and then notice the play on the other angles that I'm trying to establish, although I do have a brittleness that I have to respect. So in all actuality, this is the reference that set the tone for everything else that I'm doing on this tree, Pierre, because it gives me the idea of verticality that I'm trying to carry through the rest of the design. And this is exactly, you know, we've talked about this with the past three streams where you have that primary branch or that defining branch that sets the tone for all of your other branches. Well, in this instance, for this tree, that defining branch is not this one or this one or this one or this one. It's actually this one. And this is what's educating the entirety of the design here. And that's a really fun but nuanced approach to taking that feature that gives this tree value and using that feature to kind of create a story around it. And I really enjoy this kind of design, particularly getting to do it with you guys. But there's a way that we maximize kind of that feel of that design. And this kind of taking that design cue from the rest of the tree starts with that branch. Yeah, I like this. Now, there's a really nasty little area here, this. I'm sure all of your guys' eyes are going to that right there, right? That circular space that's created by this curve and this curve, right? We're gonna have to do something about that. Anytime we create a circular shape, that automatically draws your attention. Now this branch moves out like this. This branch moves like this, right? That's a real problem, that's a challenge here. Can we break that up by dropping this down into here? Can we break it up by hiding and flirting this over into here? There's ways that we handle that because structurally there's nothing I can do about that, right? But that is an area that we're gonna have to fix. This is nice here, this is nice here, this is nice here. They're all following the same thematic kind of piece of movement. I'm gonna come up a little bit more here. 
feels pretty good. You can carry this back down right there. Feels nice, okay. Now we're in here. Now, I don't want to be competing with this. My question is, should I go ahead, should I get rid of this or this, okay? I've either got the one towards the front or the one towards the back because I've got these pieces right in here that I feel like I really need to maximize the quality of this branch and its ability to survive inside of this design. Or do I go ahead and pull them both away? Do I pull both of these away? You guys let me know what you think. While you guys are thinking about that, I'm gonna work on the gin up top here. Ooh, she comes off, comes off quite, quite easy. Still in a period of growth, Cryptomeria are. What do they say, Kendall? Uh, I think we're still waiting on the lag, but uh, Bonsai Guy has a question. What you got, Bonsai Guy? Oh, it's a, how long, will after, how long after this work will the tree get into a new pot? And then also, what does aftercare look like? Yeah, yeah, good question. So I'm guessing, I'm guessing that this work is going to be minimal enough, depending on how this tree responds after this work, that we may go ahead and do some root work next year. But this root work from a bald and burlapped piece from a nursery into its final bonsai pot, which for a vertical tree like this, of this nature and this level of design, is probably going to be a fairly shallow, wide container, or maybe even a slab. And there's a slab actually below this tree. If you guys look at the, um, if you guys look at the, the products below this tree, there's a slab that we put there just as a discussion piece. Granted, yeah, Cryptomeria isn't going to be growing on a uh, granite outcropping in the Rockies, but it definitely would be growing on a very shallow, flat piece of ground or something of that nature that would execute the same design concept of shallow and wide for the visual mass of container that could hold verticality like this. But if we can, it's going to take us probably two or three repottings to actually get this tree down from this vertical root ball, where this tree was planned to have a very deep root system in the, in the landscape, to a, a shape of a root system that would fit into either that container or potentially a, a, a shallow, narrow, elongated container. All right, we got some feedback what you got? about those branches. What you got? Um, Gary says the front goes. Uh, Paul says, I still think the upper branch dropping down will solve the problem. Eric likes it as it is. Um, Gary says, leave the foliage behind the gin. Um, Alex says, the front. Uh, Ryan says, the front. Uh, break up the visual with the back. Break up the visual. Uh, break up that line. Bishop likes likes the foliage in the front. It says it balances out the foliage lower that's behind. Uh huh. Brian says, take the front one. Jason says, take the front. Everyone's saying, take the front away. Take the front, huh? Continue right, to the, highlight the, the gin. First. Yeah. There's the front. Let's start with the. Let's do the back now. Hmm. Yes, please. So, very fundamental reason why, right? You have this feature. Now you don't want to isolate this feature so it's like standing alone. Okay, you don't want to do that. You've got interaction here. You've also got interaction here. So we have those elements, but you also don't want to compete with that feature and we know we need light to get this to be healthy enough to interact. One last concept. We've got this formal upright. We're up, right? Very vertical. We need asymmetry. So both of those pieces were giving us length here where you've got this branch that's coming up like this. To have that asymmetry out here, even in a formal upright, is an extremely important design concept. By taking them both out, we now move that visual direction this way, because this is here, that's there, this is what's going to give our tree interest, and we've got the buttress on the trunk to anchor that kind of distribution of mass. I feel like that just gave validation to that shape in such a far more significant greater way, particularly because this branch exists right here. This branch, oh, that's just my wiring, okay. 
This branch is actually maybe one of the most important branches on the tree, right here. To cut that line, this is gonna be here, this is gonna be growing up here. Maybe in the future even this piece comes off. That's a little bit too extreme for tonight, but that's an interesting concept to start to think about how we're gonna manifest the rest of this design. Okay, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time doing deadwood work on this. This is just gonna be broken, torn tips. But Ricardo, if you wanna come in here, kind of show you guys how I would handle tips like this. Now, Cryptomeria doesn't have sandblasting. It's not gonna have um, the kind of elements that would create juniper-like deadwood. So, and we know that it's very brittle. Just to take your, take your root cutters and kind of bend it at precarious angles and get that snapping of that. And then when we start to create gin like this, we really wanna leave the backbone of really solid branching. You don't wanna show all these spidery little uh, fragments of gin everywhere, like all of these little pieces of ramification, because those are young. That would be young looking deadwood. But we wanna show this tear. We wanna show these breaks at the tips. Okay, so to just take your root cutters and start to fracture those pieces down, okay? That's how we create the kind of deadwood that a cryptomeria would have. And this, you can see that that's already what's happened here. Now we'll come back and refine this tip. But I'm just gonna do a basic breakdown of these, create some different lengths. This actually feels kind of like crappy. There we go, that feels a lot better. Feels a lot more true to form. Okay, let's keep moving. So now we're up to this big long piece right here, right? This piece I feel probably has some of the more significant potential to execute some interesting design, but the question is how long? Because we've got this big, beautiful, nice length here with some ramification around it. We could cut this whole piece off right here and have this kind of out and out, or we could gin the tip of this. I feel like this branch here where we've got, and I'm gonna rotate this towards Ricardo so we can have a little bit more of an in-depth conversation about this. Okay, notice this branch right here where we've got these finer pieces of ramification and we've got this kind of extension of this branch. This is very, very interesting because now we've almost got multiple layers that have this very beautiful movement to it. We have that same potential right here where you've got this finer guy that can kind of cut the line. Nope. You had that finer guy that could cut the line. You've got this guy here that could come back and disguise. We've got some buds here. Cryptomeria will push vigorously on this growth once it's exposed, so we'll just wait for more growth. Okay, but we've also got this upper piece here that does discuss apical dominance or the presence of some sort of apical uh, secondary apex, ter tertiary apex. I don't know if it's appropriate right here, and I feel like this tuft, this little tuft is a nice transition zone. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take this right there, okay? And that creates that length without that mass. That feels appropriate, okay? And what that does is that starts to open up the rest of what we have here for these branches to have their space and potentially to create that kind of dynamic that we were talking about. So I'm gonna come back to the front now. Arthur, blast me back out. Okay, and I'm gonna scoot back a little bit. This piece was so tall, we had to come up with a little bit of a makeshift turntable. Okay, so now we're looking at this upper region. And I'm thinking, do we go ahead and pull some of the height out of this upper apical mass or upper apical region? What do you guys think? This is kind of gonna come down to that last real significant piece of design input so that we can make that educated decision. I see this staying fairly tall here. I see this staying relatively almost juvenile in form for a formal upright cryptomeria that's lost this much, that's had this kind of de deconstruction of its structure. This almost feels appropriate to me with maybe a few of these upper apical pieces. But maybe we should drop this piece down to be the secondary or maybe this stays up and this piece comes down so that we get the visual mass pushed off to this side. You guys tell me what you think. High point on the right, high point on the left. I'm interested to get your feedback. I'll put some structural wire on this guy while you're deciding. Kendall, what do you think? High point on the right or high point on the left? I don't, 
I don't know that I like it. I don't know that I like it high. Mm, you want it to be lower? Yeah. Do you want it to be below this? Yes. Wow. Wow. You want me to kill off this whole upper section? Kind of. Wow. Jeez. Brutal. Do you want this to be the apex? Yeah. Oh, wow. Kindle making big calls. <laughs> Let me, I'm, maybe I need to, are other people saying that? I don't know. No, <laughs> probably not. I mean, it's there. It definitely <laughs> is there. What do you think, Arthur? High point on the right. High point on the right. Lime, what do you think? <laughs> Lime is not willing to make any commitments. So we go up. Lime, we get out. High point on the right would be tight. Ricardo, what do you think? <sighs> Fine. People are saying high point on the right. Um, high point on the right? Someone agreed with me. Ah, uh, yeah, nice, um. nice, <laughs> nice. In all actuality, that was my first thought was killing off that whole upper portion. Why would you not, why would you not kill off the whole upper portion? This becomes the, the point that you guys have to focus on. Look at the transition of taper. Wah. Wah. It's perfect, it's perfect. If you got it, right? Smoke them if you got them. You got it, you can't get rid of it. Shh. Well, explain that to me. Okay, so you start out at this width, and as you move up this tree, this transition of that line in thickness is literally perfect. It's like, shah, while it's also straight. It's almost impossible to find a ramrod straight line for a formal upright that also includes the point where you see the greatest transition of taper. This tree is like one in a million in terms of having those two pieces at the same, in the same piece of material at the same vantage point that gives you everything that you want. Buttressing base different lengths and branches, not even two-dimensional, you have three-dimensional in this feature branch, perfect transition of taper, and based on the design that we've chosen where we've pushed in here, we're pushing out there, if we skew that apex off to that side, now all of a sudden we've created asymmetry in a formal upright tree. Now we also have the ability to maintain a little bit more symmetry right here. Is that exciting? Does it become not so formal if we use this as the, as the piece and we shorten that? Whew. I'm having a... There's a lot of contention in the chat. People are yeah. saying left, right, left, take them both off. Take them both off. Holy smokes. This tree just became so freaking cool. Oh, here we go. Let's make some decisions. Dun, dun, dun. Ah, ah. Let's do that. Let's do that. Yep. I feel like, I feel like, and this is, this is going to be a personal thing, but I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and share this with you guys. Even though the opportunity was there to maintain that centered line all the way up through the apex of the tree, anytime you guys have a chance in design to take what people expect and just, just a little twist it, just a little bit, what that does is it causes them to look and look again, right? Look, I see what I expect. It's not what I expected. Wait, what happened there? That's how you get people to really look at your work or value that kind of twist on the natural interpretation that we've been trained to see as bonsai practitioners. So just by taking that small expected and tweaking it a little bit, I don't want to say you create the unexpected, but you kind of do create the unexpected, right? So excited about this tree. Linda commented on, there's so many branches on the right side. Yeah. Um, so yeah. are you gonna balance that out with the apex at the right or is that just gonna be in sort of asymmetrical style? Well, so again, Linda, and this, this is particularly pertinent to, you know, discussions that we have in classes where we're designing trees together. And again, I did want to tell you guys, uh, class registration, new class schedule is going out um, last week of August. We're actively working on the new class schedule. If you guys want to get into the notification of the class schedule prior to it being made public, um, 
email info at bonesimri.com and get on the class waiting list because we've got a big waiting list. It probably won't have any space for classes once it goes public. It'll just be for students to refer to. If you guys want on there, get on there. Anyways, Linda, having this push in and then this push out, even though we have a formal upright tree, you guys don't be doped into formal upright meaning symmetry, right? Symmetry means a young design. Asymmetry means an older design. You've got this branch that's giving you this cue, right? You've got this ramrod straight trunk, it's beautiful, but still asymmetry in that canopy is what makes this interesting versus young and uninteresting. And so this is why we've pushed in here and we've run out there. Now there's still some fudge factor here, right? But the fundamental fact of creating that structure that gives us that asymmetry, even in this very static trunk line, that's a big part of interesting formal upright design. Mr. Kimura, of any other person that I've seen execute bonsai design was able to milk and finesse more interest out of a formal upright design than any other artist I've seen anywhere else in the world. And he did it by playing on the idea of moving your eye through the design with length, okay? So if you guys take nothing away from tonight except for the concept that if we're able to move people's eyes through the design, we will have a much, much, much more successful composition. That is literally worth six years of apprenticing. Okay, that might be overstating it, but it's pretty close. But for me, that movement to the right is offset by the branch on the left. Maybe a little bit. I guess it depends on how long these are, right? You're right. right. And the fact that this doesn't have any visual weight. Yeah. So what if in like five years, these are all like, and then all of a sudden we're pulling in here and we're pushing out there. Right. That's just the collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. Now the tree is saying, yeah, you thought you were really clever in that stream when you came up with that design idea. Guess what? No. This is where I'm going. This is actually, this is actually, this is actually where you should have gone or where you just didn't know I was going to go. But thanks for rescuing me from Sugawa's backyard lot. <laughs> Cut that four gauge a little short. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep it long. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go long. And I'm gonna make this a branch up here. That's just gonna dive out here a little bit. Take some of these pieces off. Boom boom. Feels really interesting. I'm gonna come back into that. Let me clean that up just a little bit. Matthew's wondering if your expectation of growth for this tree, does that change your styling or do you make the best with what you have now? So I think that's a really good question. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, we're going to grow this out. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. I think that those pieces of the puzzle are really, really necessary to have that kind of planning in place so that you know why you're making the decisions and what you're trying to accomplish with those decisions. However, I think, too, every time you maximize the material that you're working on at that very point in time, you give that tree an extra step ahead. Then a lot of people use, I'm going to just let it grow, as justification to not do the work. So I'm going to wire out every single piece here, knowing I'm going to get growth that's going to change my design concept. But I'm going to let that happen by increasing photosynthetic efficiency, laying out those branches, 
you guys should check out the Scotts Pine um, traditional bonsai design stream two weeks ago to see that branch pad formation that I'm gonna use. So I'm gonna lay that out, I'm gonna increase that efficiency, I'm gonna let that feed back budding, I'm gonna let that feed internal growth, I'm gonna let that feed the development of the branches that I want to be a part of the design, and I'm still gonna be reducing the number of branches in this design significantly from this point moving forward. But every time I take it that far, that tree gets that much better than I thought it could have based on that input of energy and the increase in efficiency, okay? Put a little bit of something, something on that. And then I'm gonna show you guys how I clean out the branch of uh, Cryptomeria. And I'm gonna wire out a branch for you guys to show you stylistically what this is gonna look like. And I'm gonna turn you loose for the night so that you guys can have wonderful dreams about formal upright trees and how you're gonna do that little <laughs> to make them special. I think this, and there was a point during my apprenticeship when I was watching Mr. Kimura set the structure on this formal upright, and I was like, this style of formal upright tree has got to be the single most difficult, single most demanding style that's created in bonsai. And I still, to this day, oh, believe that to be true, that this is the single most difficult styling decision-making process that we experience in bonsai because it is so abnormal and so unusual and requires so much intelligent thought. Oh man, I'm all about that. This is actually gonna look like a real cryptomeria when it's all done. What are you seeing that makes you say that? So this, this piece, right, that piece is so very special. It almost, I almost feel like, and, and when Ricardo was filming this in the stream, I almost felt like just him moving up the trunk with these short, long, short, long, small tufts, multiple apices, this big dead branch, it almost felt like he was like, like kind of like riding like an elevator up a redwood or something like that. And the cryptomeria that I've seen in the natural environment feel very, very similar to this with this kind of up, out, real randomness, but then we can give them order and we can create these multiple pads inside of that singular branch line. You know, these are all gonna bud, this is gonna run, these are gonna form pads inside of this, and you're not gonna see all of this in the eventual finished product. You're gonna have a pad here, pad here, pad here, pad here, pad here, and it's gonna be this really interesting, intricate, uh, interconnectivity of all of these branches. Right now, it's bare bones. This is the barest you're ever gonna see this tree be. Well, actually, once I clean it, right? And then from this point forward, when you start filling in those lines and you create this bigger, bigger tree concept in five years, I promise you guys, when we revisit this in the stream in five years and I'm showing you guys how to refine a mature cryptomeria branch for exhibition, you're gonna be like, holy crap, when we show you the original work of this, and that is that process of understanding the finished goal and how you get there. But if you guys just pay attention, as we build these streams and we're working on this raw stock and we're developing the Scots Pine, the Stewardia, the Cryptomeria, the Blue Rug Juniper, we're literally showing you guys how to create the structure for a tree that is only going to get better, right? And these are the points that we're focusing on, the lines, the angles, the environment, the, the, the concept, the asymmetry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what I'm looking at when I see this. I'm just like, this is gonna be absolutely mm. outstanding. Where do you see the foliage filling in on the gin? On the gin? Yeah. I don't know I guess yet. You have to see. I don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. that one's, that one's going to be the unpredictable, right? Do we have another apex here and we get rid of this, right? So that you've got this little tufted out around this deadwood. Do we let this run out and actually pull in from there? I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I love that. Okay, I'm going to show you guys how we clean out. One of, I'm going to rotate around to one of these good, juicy, thick, dense branches. Ugh. Oh, man. Yeah, okay, the whole thing's kind of falling apart. Got too many branches on the ground. Ricardo, can you see over my shoulder? So, Cryptomeria, if we just cut through this foliage, what's gonna happen is we're gonna leave behind some really ugly brown, even red colors. You, you'll always see the cut sites on Cryptomeria. And just like a juniper, we wanna open up, say, this first quarter to half inch on a tree this big. First quarter to half inch, we're gonna take branches off the bottom, we're gonna take branches that are either directly off the, off the top, completely off, or we may come in here and just take these back 
And if you can see here, you've got these really, really tight interior buds like this. We can cut back to these, oh, that one broke off. We can cut back to these really tight interior buds and use that for density in the maturing branch moving forward. Now we've got the same considerations in terms of wanting to make sure we don't have an accumulation of three, four, five branches at one junction. But all of these places where we've got these kind of big, robust, already uh, creating ramification in these uh, secondaries like this one, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take stuff off of the bottom, we're gonna take stuff off of the top, we're gonna clean that up and we're gonna create a very planular, very planular shape to the branch. So I'm gonna take off some of these strong tips. I don't want that interior piece to be getting super big and long and robust. Take these guys off of the bottom. Off the bottom, off the bottom, off the bottom, off the bottom, off the bottom. And then notice how this whole tip kind of sags down. I'm gonna find those lateral pieces. Notice how that bud stays lateral. That's gonna become the new leader to my branch. And notice how now, when we look at this, I've got a few of these vertical growers. I can cut those back to little interiors. Got a few more of these vertical growers. I can cut those back to vertical interiors. Cut that back to a vertical interior. Notice how beautiful and nice and spacious that branch is. That's a perfect branch to lay down into that structure and help me form that really refined pad, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna come back in here and I'm gonna prune off anything growing too vertically, I'm gonna shorten back to interiors. Anywhere where I've got, again, notice this crotch. I've got a branch here, I've got a branch here, and I've got this adventitious piece. I don't want threes there, so I'm gonna take that off. I got some of these guys growing off of the bottom. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna clean my bottom off, okay? Got these guys growing in the crotch. I'm gonna go ahead and clean my crotch off. Okay, I'm gonna come back in here, areas of three. I'm gonna clean those off. And what you're gonna find when you guys get down to the eventual structure that you're actually gonna wire, there's gonna be very few pieces of foliage that are left here. That's okay, that's okay. That's all part of creating that photosynthetic efficiency in the pad. You lay this out to the growth that you can utilize. By doing so, particularly in a cryptomeria, which is an elongating species, you're absolutely going to be focusing the energy on the pieces of growth that are gonna to contribute to your branch shape and your branch design. Okay, now if this were a juniper, we'd have to obviously handle this a little bit differently. We'd have to be more conservative. So notice how this tip takes a dive. Unless I absolutely need the length, which for this tree, I'm trying to compact these pads, I'm gonna take that off and I'm gonna leave that lateral piece. This is a big transition point for us as we start branch formation. Anything that starts to go down, for example, you're looking at all of these going down, you have these guys laying lateral, we can come in here and we can take off all of these pieces. Even though they're the tip of the branch, we have the ability to come in here and take all of these off. And then what you're left with is this beautiful lateral laying branch. It means you can use less wire or you'll end up with a much better product by making those pruning decisions. Take stuff off the bottom, come back up here. Okay, notice all of these pieces on the bottom here. I'm just gonna kind of pull that branch tip up. I wanna keep the length. Remember, the play on the length is a big part. I've got this nice short branch on the interior here, lowest on the trunk. I'm gonna come back in, I'm gonna counter that short length with a really long piece of growth. Okay, and this is, um, this is another interesting thing to think about for you guys. If you want to show the play in length, if you have short, right next to short, you must have long, right? That's like the saying in, in Deadwood. If you, have, if you have foreground, right next to foreground, you must have background. You can't have foreground middle ground in order to maximize shadow play on your, on your Deadwood work on a tree. You've gotta have foreground background in order to maximize that shadow play, right? So if we have short, we must have long. If we have foreground, we must have background. These are design pieces that you guys can apply and creating those extremes in this compact shape that is bonsai is really what allows you to design well. Any questions, Deeds? Yeah, we do. Cool. Um, Alex commented that when we see the top view of the trees, when we have that aerial shot, uh -huh. um, you see how much of a perfect circle oval, oval um, the layout of the branches make for photosynthetic efficiency. Right. Um, as you work with the tree, how do you visualize that and always achieve it? Is that something that you just learn with time? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really interesting piece of the puzzle, thinking about that, um, thinking about that layout. But for me, you know, I'm going to go back to a concept that I illustrated for you guys uh, earlier in the stream. I pointed out two branches that were technically stacked on top of each other, 
but one of them occurred uh, slightly forward on the circumference of the trunk, and one of them occurred slightly towards the back on the circumference of the trunk, right? When you have that opportunity to create that, that so you've got, you know, you've got your trunk here, and you've got a branch originating here and a branch originating here. Well, it's very possible that the branch originating here could have that angle, and the branch originating here could have that angle. But because this originates ahead of this one, it's always got to come forward in the structure. This one's always got to come back behind it. And in doing that, when you have branches that look like this, and you straighten them all out, when you're looking down from the tree, you just have this wonderful orientation of branches evenly distributed. And, and the reason that my designs have that, or the reason that a well-styled tree has that, is because you're allowing the, key, the tree to dictate that layout of branching. And that is very organic in terms of a tree's input of energy to create maximum output of photosynthetic resource. And I don't think that's learned. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm letting the tree's natural layout of its branches dictate my decisions. And that is one thing that I cannot stress to you guys enough. You know, we talk about bonsai being an art, but I think bonsai is a collaboration, right? Living sculpture, to be sure. Living sculpture, to be sure. Collaboration, you don't dictate what the tree does. You let the tree dictate what the tree does, right? And each tree is giving you indicators. This tree had this big radical branch that was very, very unique and special, that kind of set the tone for the design tonight. How do we use it? How do we use the characteristics of cryptomeria to maximize it? And how do we make those decisions that give us the maximum amount of efficiency? That has entirely constructed this entire design. I, can't, I just can't stress that enough, that when you start to let the tree dictate design, everything all of a sudden magically starts to work out. We have a few more questions about design. Um, Maddie's wondering if you think the two branches above the gin will create a bar branch over time or probably. too much swelling. Probably, probably. We're gonna, we're gonna definitely make some very significant structural decisions before we let it detriment the quality of the structure. But inevitably, anywhere where there's still multiple branches, right, that will become an issue at some point. Now, keep this in mind though. My priority in this design is to get rid of the stuff that we absolutely don't need to start developing the structure that we do want and, and, and do, do need, right? And so there are times where I've got things that aren't causing problems yet that over the course of the next two, three, four, five years, I will be making some very significant decisions on. And we've gone through that in other design exercises that we've done in the live stream. Okay, we've, done, we've gone through that where we've said, you know what, this is here, this is gonna come off next year, this is gonna come off the following year, if all goes well, this will be the one that we eliminate and this is what we're gonna be left with. I do have too many branches on this tree for the final design, absolutely. I've left myself that kind of grace so that we can come back in and make those decisions as the tree evolves. But I've also let the tree have its, have its own ability and space to be able to give me some feedback and kind of supply some of that really necessary um, collaborative say in what it's going to become so that it, it, it works for both of us. Okay, I'm going to wire this branch out for you guys, show you a good cryptomeria branch, and then we're going to say goodnight. How are we doing on time? 15 minutes. Got 15 minutes? Styling like nobody business. Chris wants to know what's the long-range plan for the lowest branch on the right, or I guess it's to your left. You're gonna keep it short or grow it out and up. This this little guy? Yep. This this is like the most one of the most important branches on the tree. Outside of the big, outside of the big Donkey Kong branch up top, that thing is absolutely imperative. Because again, that's what gives me that play on length that I love so much. And this is very indicative of Cryptomeria. You know, there's other species that really flourish with this kind of design as well. Hemlock is a big one, right? Hemlock, uh, Kamitsuga, whatever, where, wherever you're at in the world. Larch is also another one that plays on this short, lower down, long, higher up. It's what, it's what starts to talk about asymmetry in ancient. That little branch combined with this big, massive tree all the way up, three quarters, or uh, was, yeah, uh, two thirds, we'll say two thirds up the trunk of the tree, those two pieces catalyze this design. This little branch, this big branch, boom, done.
Uh, Gary wants to know what's the maximum percentage of foliage that can be removed safely? Yeah, as long as this tree has a healthy amount of foliage and is growing in a, a really robust way, and we're back in that energy positive, which we know by this point we're back in energy positive. And here's the other thing to think about for you guys. Okay, in the Pacific Northwest, and this may not be true across the Northern Hemisphere, in the Pacific Northwest, we hit 106 at Mirai, I believe. Um, you guys were here for, what, the high 90s? You weren't here for 106. Thank yourself for that. Um, but now we're in the ah, mid-70s. Little pop, not bad. We're in the mid-70s. Okay, so being in the mid-70s, what that means for us is that we're getting into that point where the trees are starting to grow again. And interestingly enough, you know, over the past two days, Troy has had a really, really uh, significant increase in the water utilization at 75 or 80 degree temperatures. And, and, and that's fascinating to me because in that increase in water utilization, that's basically the trees saying, hey, we got that, we got that summer dormancy thing happening and now we're past that summer dormancy thing and we'd really like to rock out and see if we can't put on some significant growth. And Troy, being the astute uh, practitioner and garden director that he is at Mariah is saying, I see what's happening here. I recognize that you guys are ready to rock. Um, let's do some serious growing. And he's giving them the water that they need. And this is where we're going to be shifting into fall fundamentals and eventually fall watering as, as our trees across North America kind of pick up. This becomes, this fall season of growth becomes an ideal time to be styling trees. If we're doing it early enough in the fall season of growth, we can get away with a far greater amount of foliage reduction in our trees, okay? Because we have the time between now and dormancy in the wintertime for them to adjust their sugars and uh, starch load to be able to prepare to potentially put on a little bit more photosynthetic mass or at least accumulate energy to be able to compensate for that loss of photosynthetic load and prepare themselves for a spring push next year. If you wait too long, what ends up happening is you don't get enough sugar starch production to be able to drive a good bud push next year, and you actually have a tree that's significantly under, undergunned for winter temperatures as well as next year's growth. So this is a really, really, really good time on elongating species just past the, the intense heat. We'll probably get another heat spell. None of it will be anywhere near as intense as what we got because the days are getting shorter, the sun's angle is changing for us. And you guys in Southern California or other places in the United States, you might not be there yet. For us in the Pacific Northwest, this is what makes us the nursery capital of the world because we do tend to have a very short amount of dormancy prior to that fall push of growth. Troy just commented, that being said, uh, you should check water after the stream. <laughs> so I'm so flattered you're tuning in, Troy. <laughs> um, Gary's wondering where the strength comes from in cryptomeria. Vascular tissue. Vascular tissue. Vascular tissue. As an elongating species, vascular tissue. You can do really intense work to the root system. You can do really intense work to the foliage mass. Cryptomeria is a lot like a larch in terms of they push a lot of water, they push a lot of sugars and starches. They're an extremely vigorous tree from that perspective. That vascular tissue tends to be the epicenter of their strength and where they, they derive a lot of the resources that they use to grow. Maddie has an interesting question, comment. Uh, Maddie says, you say you always want to you want to incorporate more color in bonsai, uh -huh. um, and with the cryptomeria putting off red wounds, is that something that you're thinking about playing with in the design? Uh -huh. <laughs> I, had, I hadn't actually thought about it, but um, that's uh, interesting. I mean, I think that would probably, that's like saying like, you know, would you want to break all the tips of pine needles to have more color? You know, I think probably for the tree, it's not, uh, it's not optimum. And I think for the demonstration of craftsmanship, it's definitely a little bit off, offbeat to show um, the death of, of, of the tips and, and those cuts. But would it add some color? Yeah, maybe the wrong kind of color that you're looking for, though. But it's an interesting, that's an interesting take on color. I, I, like, I like where your head is at. That's a, that is a, a, very, uh, a very creative thought right there. And then Gary's wondering how long before you treat the gin? You know, treat the gin in terms of coming back in and doing the work, Gary, or what, what treating them? 
uh, lime sulfur, because I won't ever lime sulfur the gin of, of Cryptomeria. But uh, as far as coming back and doing the gin work, I will come back and do the gin work as I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be wiring this tree out this week. I'll come back and do the gin work as I wire this out so that I can take advantage of it while it's in its fully brittle, totally, you know, the interesting thing about Cryptomeria is as they die uh, or as the tissue dries out, it actually becomes more pliable, which probably has a pretty significant discussion to water load. However, there never seems to be a time of year where they're actually super flexible in the styling process. And so we just accept that cryptomeria is going to be extremely brittle. And it was interesting too, when we were loading this up at the nursery, uh, we potentially may have purchased the lindens that we saw in the video, it might have happened. And we stuffed the cryptomeria in last after all of the lindens were already in. And the gentlemen who were helping me load <laughs> were like, hey, you realize that that's a very brittle tree. I was like, I, I, I definitely recognize that. They're like, if you're gonna use that for anything valuable, we need to package that really carefully, which they did, and I appreciated. People at Sugawa's are absolutely outstanding. We've officially hit the end of, end of our road for for rotation of the tree. But I'm gonna prop it back up one more time. Take a look at this sample branch. Ricardo, can you get a nice shot of that? Let's see if we get that, yes. <clears throat> Here we go, guys. <clears throat> okay, so that branch is kind of going towards the back. Now notice how I've got that nice kind of real swooping branch there. I've got this other smaller branch, and now that I look at it here, I'm assuming this is going to form. I'm not going to wire this real small guy. I'm going to let that grow. I might actually bring this a little bit more here, kind of a tuft here little top to that, nice swooping branch there, but that nice, beautiful kind of planular up and then out sort of formation. This is a cryptomeria, Shoo, right? Up and out, up and out. And if you guys see these in a, a really refined cryptomeria, you'll recognize this will get super dense. They get these really beautiful pads in the branches when they start out like this. Over the course of time, as we clear them out, just like a needle juniper, they start, to, they start to develop this ramification. Now they go past that, they get too far back, we gotta start that over again, right? But they'll just get that age on those branches, really beautiful branch structure that they form, okay? So we're gonna be heavily weighted to the right, we're gonna keep that small branch down there, we'll probably decrease the mass on that branch significantly. We're gonna be cultivating all of those interior buds, a few of these smaller pads over on this side, definitely working to facilitate health in here, pushing the apex slightly off so that we get that asymmetry, probably bringing a little bit of this up so that we do have a secondary apex here. And I think we've got the, the beginning of a really outstanding cryptomeria. And, and the thing that I'm most excited about with this for you guys is coming back in two years, three years, four years, and then again in five years, and showing you what is possible in such a short time frame with a piece of material that gives you all of the right bones to create a good bonsai with. I have a picture of the before if we want to show them that too, yeah. just to show this transition. Yeah, yeah, we should see that. All right, here we go. We should see that before, before style. I bet, that's, I bet that's kind of an interesting thing to look at. How's it look? It's definitely a before. <laughs> bushy. <laughs> it looks bushy. <laughs> yes. Cool. Cool. We have any other questions? Um. Yeah, we do. There's a couple more. Um. So Tom w wants to follow up about that repotting you were discussing earlier. Mm. Would the second or third repotting be in consecutive two to three years? No. 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 And and I think probably what it would look like is we would do uh, a repotting, assuming the tree moves forward with strength and health. 
over the fall, do a pretty significant repotting next spring and, and potentially put it in a temporary container or even heal it into a healing inbed. Um, where we could allow the tree to rapidly regain um, health, maybe ma mainly in kind of coarse um, bark as opposed to actually putting it in soil, allowing a lot of oxygen. This is a big way that, that we're able to move pines out of a real clay, heavy field grown condition and get their roots regenerated very quickly. So maybe we'll do that next year. The following year we would come back in and we'd try to do one more step and then I doubt we would touch it again until we got to that five or six year mark where we were putting it into its show container and really bringing it to its final fruition in design. So the first, the first repotting is gonna be significant. Second one's probably gonna be a little bit more geared towards refinement. And the third one is gonna be the one where we'll fully eliminate the field soil and we'll put it into that, event, that, that kind of final container to, to maximize that composition. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. Uh, I, I hope that you're learning about how to select material, how to see other opportunities in material. Um, for me, this whole nursery series and working on some of these more, I would say accessible pieces of material for you guys has really reinvigorated uh, my bonsai approach and just kind of seeing that charm of starting the process, how you set that process up to be successful and getting to share that with you guys. Um, I really look forward to Mariah Live continuing to grow. I hope you guys enjoy the filters in the archive and, um, and, and are, are enjoying everything that we're creating. We've got a few videos coming your way this week um, to kind of cap off some new things that we're trying. And uh, as always, we very much appreciate your guys' support and helping us make this happen. Any of you guys that are out there watching for free, um, this, this is something that we do every week and we, we, we put our heart and soul into it. So we hope you guys enjoyed and, and uh, would appreciate your support and encourage you to sign up for Mariah Live. Um, impromptu Q&A Thursday, Thursday, 10 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And uh, we hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. If we don't see you Thursday, we'll see you next Tuesday for Super Tuesday. Uh, lots of love and uh, enjoy the, uh, the um, what is it? The eclipse. the eclipse. The eclipse. Oh, yeah. All right. We won't see you there. We'll be here hunkered down with gas and water and food. But uh, I hope you guys are safe <laughs> and enjoy it. Happy week. Happy bonsai. Talk to you then.